everyone. We appreciate having you with us once again. And our very special guest coming up this time is Greg Braden. Greg, welcome. Alec, brother, I have to tell you, I'm so excited to be with you today. I, I saw our interview on my media schedule and uh, I got a big smile on my face. I've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now. I want our audience to know this is totally unrehearsed. I have absolutely no idea what is about to happen, but I know it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to trust it's a dance and I'm going to trust you to lead me in this dance, brother, wherever we go. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. I love it. And thank you for making the time to be here. So that's that's the nature. Sound is a fluid energy form and we're just going to improv yeah. here. So. Man, you know, you know, sort of under or stating the obvious that, you know, you've had a very prolific career and so many admirers and followers for your many books, teachings and workshops. But, but I think what might be a little less well known is your background and roots as a musician. So to get us rolling, would you like to share a little bit about that? Oh, so we're, we're going to talk about the obscure history of, of Greg's musical career. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's uh, I don't talk about it a lot. A lot of people know that I, I am a musician. I was a musician long before. Um, let me ask this: Can I tell a story? Are you okay? Do we do we have time? Can I just give a little a little bit Please of background do. on on what this is? I uh, I think a lot of our listeners and certainly my uh, my fans know a little bit about my history. I, I come from a a very dysfunctional family, an unhealthy, dysfunctional, uh, abusive, alcoholic family. Uh, my father was the abuser. Uh, my mom, my younger brother, and I got the, the bad end of that deal, and music was one of the first forms of refuge for me, Alec, and I know many of our, uh, our viewers can really relate to that. We, we tend, we find ourselves going uh, to music to help us to feel differently in the presence of our life experience and our joy as well as our pain. Um, we know that as adults, but when you're a kid, you don't always know all the mechanisms. You just know you feel better when you're in that music. Well, for me, this was back in the 1960s when uh, a new form of music was emerging. It was certainly new at the time. And uh, I, I'll just tell you, I, I, had, I had two experiences that I'll relate to you uh, that had a direct impact on my life and actually focused, helped me to focus on where my life is today. The first of those, I, I went to see a Jefferson Airplane concert in 1968. I'll tell you exactly where it was. Anybody is watching from Kansas City, Missouri. It was Memorial Hall in Kansas City, Kansas, right across the state line. I sat in the front row. I proclaimed my love for Grace Slick. I sat there and said, Grace, I love you. I love you. And she completely ignored me, completely discounted my, my love for her. <laughs> but here's what happened. In that hall, I watched about, at that time, it was 30, maybe 40,000 people, and they were moved by the sound of what they were hearing. They were moved by the music. They were moved by the lyrics that were expressing what we were feeling at that time. 1968, a lot of turbulence, not unlike what we're seeing today. There was racial turbulence. There was uh, conflict of the Vietnam War. Uh, it was a very intense time, and the music helped people to move that energy. And so I saw those people moved by the music. But here's the thing, Alec. When the music stopped and we walked out of the hall, the feeling stopped as well, and people needed something outside of themselves to create that feeling again. They need to buy an album, or in that time... Um, you know, uh, people were using eight track tapes in the late 60s and early 70s. I don't know if they were there exactly 1968. The point is they needed something outside of their bodies. Now, at the same time, I saw something else. Now, I'm not going to say that, uh, that the, the, the message necessarily, I was on board with the message, but I went to see a man named Billy Graham, an evangelical, evangelical speaker. Uh, speaking in an outdoor arena to 70,000 people. And he had no band behind him, no music, but he had words. And the words that he spoke meant something to the people that were in that stadium. And here's the difference. When we left the stadium, something had changed within the people that heard those words. And they began to think of themselves differently. And they didn't need something external 
to their experience. They didn't need to go buy an album or they didn't need to buy, you know, a tape or even a book because they heard something from Billy Graham that changed the way they felt about themselves and their relationship to the world and the change stayed with them. Those two experiences to me in the early age of my life, I knew that I wanted to contribute to the world in some way and I didn't know the best way to do that. I didn't know if it would be through a spoken word, a written word or through music. So uh, I, I was in bands from the time I illegally playing in bars from the time that I was 14 years old. And uh, I enjoyed playing the music, but I didn't like the music lifestyle, to be honest. Uh, I loved the music, but what was happening in the musicians' lives during that time in the, in the 1960s, it was just absolutely crazy. And the easiest thing was to be on the stage playing music. The hardest thing was keeping everybody's life together long enough to get onto the stage. So I, uh, I chose music as a hobby rather than a profession. And I began exploring the power of words. What could I say? What could I share to my community that would honor their relationship to themselves, their relationship to their bodies, to the earth, to the future, to the past, to God, to the cosmos, and help my friends, my family, my community, help them to navigate the changes that we find at our doorstep in, in a world of extremes. And we're living extremes right now. In some ways, today doesn't look much different than 1968. So music has played a powerful role in my life. Alec, I'm a guitar player. Uh, I continue to play. I collect guitars. Uh, I, some people are surprised. I have played at a couple of our events, and they think I'm going to play some kind of soft kumbaya folk music. And uh, I've got a, a, a beautiful Jimi Hendrix signature edition reverse headstock Fender, uh, black Fender guitar. And, uh, and I love to wail and shred on that guitar because it, my soul feels good. But I also do a lot of uh, singer songwriter. I'm actually in the studio now creating a new, uh, a new uh, I won't call it an album, I'll call it an EP, probably five songs, uh, two covers and three originals that I hope to have released later this year. So it might be more information that you wanted to know, but the point is that music has played a powerful role in my life uh, for the bulk of my adult life. It's probably been the most consistent thing, music and yoga. I started yoga in 1986. Music, I started in 1968. So interesting uh, numbers there. And um, those two things have probably been the, the most consistent practices in my life to help me to balance left and right brain, to help me to balance and find harmony in my body with the experiences that I have in my life. So, so I'll stop there and uh, uh, that laid maybe a little foundation for what you have in mind next. Well, that is outstanding, many thanks. I love that in so many levels, especially the healing power of rock and roll. Let's always hear about that, the, uh, the Jimi Hendrix strat. I, would, I will submit Jimi Hendrix, Acts as Bold as Love, maybe as the national anthem of that sound. <laughs> <laughs> so we go on with that. But yeah, you mentioned the power of the spoken word, and that's perfect. You know, I mean, I think of sound healing like the broadest possible stroke is the multitudinous and multidimensional therapeutic and transformative applications of sound, music, voice, and vibration. So yeah. the spoken word, the language we use has profound resonances on all levels of our being, which rolls right into, as good fate would have it, the topic of your new book, The Wisdom Codes. Mm. You've got that subtitle, Ancient Words to Rewire Our Brains and Heal Our Hearts. So, so what are these wisdom codes and how can we begin to apply them? Yeah, my, uh, my most recent book, it's a, a small format book that took me uh, over 40 years, Alec, to put together. It's actually very healing for me to, to bring this book together. It is called, the, the title is The Wisdom Codes, Ancient Words to Rewire Our Brains and Heal Our Hearts. And it's, it's based upon the new science. I, I could not have written this book 40 years ago because the science did not know then what the science knows now. And that is that the words we speak not only determine how we think, and that's, that's pretty much uh, accepted in, in the, the common uh, worldview as well as in the scientific literature, the words that we speak determine how we think, but they also determine what we are even capable of thinking about. The words we use 
determine what we are even capable of conceiving as possible in our lives. And this, uh, I just give you a, a beautiful example. Uh, Andrew Newberg is um, a neuroscientist, and I use a quote from him as the epigraph to the beginning of the book. And what he says is a single word has the power to change the genes that influence the stress in our lives. So one word can, can actually upregulate or downregulate a portion of our DNA as we're responding to what life is showing us. So what it tells us is that, that words are more than simply words, that the words we use <clears throat> have a, a powerful influence in our worldview as well as our view of ourselves. So I, I just want to go back a little bit. The, you can't make this stuff up. This is the way the universe works. The way these understandings came about early in the 20th century, Yale University, there was a professor at Yale University who was teaching linguistics and he took a sabbatical. He took a, a semester off and he needed someone to replace him. So he invited a colleague who was not formally trained uh, in linguistics to teach a course in native language. To teach this course, the man had to do some research in the native language. The man's name was Benjamin Lee Wharf. Some people I know are familiar with that name. And the native language that he chose to explore in his course was the Hopi language. And one of the first things that he discovered about the Hopi language was that in Hopi, they have no words for anything other than the present moment. In the Hopi language, there's no word for the past, no word for the future, no word for over here or over there. Everything is present. Everything is alive. Everything is in the moment. So what this means, for example, if, if you were standing with a Hopi, if you and I, Alec, were standing with a Hopi on, um, we live in the, um, uh, in the desert southwest. So if we were standing on a mountain top in the high desert of northern New Mexico and we saw lightning, in Hopi, we cannot say, look at that lightning over there. What we would hear the Hopi say is, it is lightning-ing, lightning-ing, because it is alive, it is present now. Or if we were on the beach looking at a wave, we would say the wave is wave-ing because it is not a noun, it is happening in the moment now. And the reason this is important <clears throat> is because in the Hopi view of the world, and I think many people know this, as well as other native traditions, not only Hopi, there is a sense of harmony and beauty in the world. They know everything is connected, everything is alive, everything it is conscious, the rock is conscious, the tree is conscious, the animals are conscious, the sky. Uh, and that harmony and that worldview, Benjamin Lee Worf believed, is the result of the words that they use to express their relationship to the world. Now, where this gets interesting is in the English language, the English language is based in separation. There is me and you, here and there, then and now, uh, good and bad, right and wrong, light and dark, success and failure. And so we tend to see the world and solve our problems through those kinds of thinking. There have always been words that our ancestors have used or collections of words or phrases that they turned to in times of need, in times of loss, uh, when they felt they needed protection, when they were in fear, that have helped them to feel differently and navigate those difficult times. Those words are preserved in their prayers, in the chants, uh, and the, the Buddhist chants, the Hindu chants, the Tibetan chants, in the mantras, uh, they are preserved in, uh, on, on the temple walls that we see in Egypt and on the tombs as instructions for the soul in terms of how to feel worthy enough to move into the next world. And I talk about all these in, in the book. So the book is a collection, a categorized collection of these ancient word codes broken down by loss and fear and protection, uh, love and things like that, uh, that have worked for our ancestors. And if they work for them consistently throughout the ages, my sense is they work for us today. Some of them I've used uh, throughout my life, such as the, the Navajo prayer of beauty uh, that reminds us that beauty already exists in all things we don't have to create it. Our job is to find it, to seek it out. 
and to see the world and the events of our lives through the lens of the beauty. Uh, and that changes us in the presence of beauty. We change the way we think, we change the way we feel. And now the science is telling us that changes the way our neurons are connecting. That in turn changes the chemistry that is released in our bodies. And we are literally changed in the presence of beauty. It's more than simply an aesthetic. So that's, that's one example. I'll just, the beauty prayer, three short phrases, the beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, the beauty upon which I base my life. I say this prayer to myself at least once a day, out loud or silently, to remind myself that the beauty already exists. I have to find it. My job is to find it in whatever the world is showing me. And that's, that's a workshop sometimes. The beauty that I live by invites me to allow that beauty to become the lens through which I view the world, not the polarization of mainstream media or my friends, my well-meaning friends on social media who are trying to get me to back one cause or another cause or believe in something. The beauty upon which I base my life, it's an invitation for me to allow the power of beauty to become the foundation upon which I make my choices and my decisions, my interactions with other people and how I honor myself. And that is just one example of one of the wisdom codes, the beauty prayer. Uh, and it's an example that shows how the words changing the neurons, changing the chemistry, change us. And, uh, and the beauty is we don't have to know a lot of technical science to enjoy this, although the science is there if we want to understand for ourselves why these things work the way they work. So long answer to a short question, Alec, and uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll stop there. I could go on, but I'll stop there and, and see where we'd like to go from here. Well, brilliant stuff to consider there because, yeah, that, that is a truism. The, probably the most powerful way to change the world is to first change yourself from within and then your experience of the world changes and what you how you show up in the world and resonate out to the world shifts. So that is beautiful via the power of words. So, and I know there's a lot more of that in the book. I just have to refer people there. So I do just want to make a little pivot, you know, from the power of words to words of power to like with the topic of intention, because you know, in the sound healing world, the first book I discovered was Jonathan Goldman's healing sounds, where he puts out that formula frequency plus intention equals healing. So, you know, these days, a lot of people are writing, teaching about intention. But mm -hmm. for me, that's becomes like a thought domino of like, how do you begin to harness and charge intention? So it's more than just mental plane wishing. So that leads us into what you talk about in the Isaiah effect, you know, that heart and emotional content charge. Would you like to get into that for a little bit? Well, it even goes beyond that. There, there is uh, a new science emerging, Alec, uh, Alec, that is called hope theory, hope theory. And this, I think, goes directly to intention because intention, well-intentioned people have used intention for a long time in the ways, the only ways they understood. But what we know is that uh, intention means different things to different people. And what the science of hope theory tells us is that it's, it's good to have the intention, but it's not enough to have only the intention to stack the deck of success and our failure. We need to have a strategy that allows our intention to come to fruition. And this is, uh, it's a little bit different way uh, for people to, to think, for some, some people possibly, but it parallels what our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions have, have always said to us uh, about how we see ourselves in the world and the actions that we must embrace and embody in our everyday lives that follow the image or the vision or the, the, the well-meaning that we have in our hearts. So, you know, we have people, I have people say this to me all the time. Um, you know, we, we make a plan together and I'll just give you a concrete example. A producer comes to me, a well-meaning, beautifully full-hearted producer and says, let's do an event together. Uh, and I trust that this event will be a success for everyone. Uh, and um, I, I intend that this is what's going to happen. 
And I say, well, that's cool. That's, it's, a, it's a great place to begin. Now, I, earlier in my career, I assumed that those producers had the experience and knew what they were doing. And on more than one occasion, I saw them fall flat on their face where they lost. They lost financially. They lost emotionally. They lost uh, respect from other, other speakers because they in, intended, but they didn't follow through with a strategy so that their intention could be honored and realized. And so now when someone says to me, you know, I, I intend that this is going to be an awesome event. I said, right on brother or sister. I intend that as well. I said, now tell me about your strategy. And sometimes they'll say, what do you mean? And I'll say, well, in this three dimensional world, we, we live in a world where the universe is going to respond to what we've put into motion. So your intention is honorable, it's beautiful, it's awesome, it's epic. And we need a strategy now in three dimension to honor that beautiful, that beautiful vision that you have. And then that sets us on a path to develop that strategy. So it's, um, it's a, uh, it, this actually goes right to the level of, of the quantum world and the way that information, the quantum world tells us that we live, we live and we are a sea of information. So it's so interesting to me because when people talk about the quantum world, and even when I go to conferences, I see uh, world-renowned physicists doing this, Alec. They say, okay, now we know there's a field, there's a field out there. There's a field that exists out there. It's been proven at the CERN superconducting super collider in Geneva, Switzerland. No doubt in their mind, there's a field out there and, and look what they're doing out there. They're separating themselves from the field. Where's the boundary where the field ends and we begin. And the moment you draw that boundary, you, you fall into the ancient trap that keeps us separate, that keeps us powerless because it, it leads us to feel and tells us that we are not part of that field. And the, the reality is that we are the field. Every atom, Every atom of our body, your body, my body, our viewers right now, the atoms that make up the molecules of our body right now, they are emerging from that field, some of them, and some are collapsing back into that field. There's this constant dance. We are emerging and collapsing into the field. What the ancients tell us, the Buddhists uh, tell us this so beautifully, uh, the Sing Sing Hymn, for example, the, um, uh, in the, the Zen text, tells us that we are actually wrinkles. We are disturbances in an otherwise homogenous field. And that the wrinkle of Greg, for example, I, I am a wrinkle held in place by my consciousness. The way I think of myself and the way I present myself in the world, so my consciousness is, is what is directing those atoms as they emerge and collapse into the form of my body into the form of my expression. And when I'm no longer in this world, I go back into that homogenous field. So once we begin to understand that, and you know, there's a fine line between science and poetry. I mean, we're, it's all about the language. It's all about the words. So nature is simple. Science is simple until we make it complex with complex words and mathematics. It's very, very simple. And when we begin to really, really get the simplicity of our relationship, that we are the field, then the idea of attention takes on uh, perhaps an even new and more powerful meaning because it tells us that first we simulate in our heart and in our mind, we simulate the potential of what it is that we want to experience. So this is the beauty that, of, of the human experience, and to the best of our knowledge, no other form of life, Alec, can do what we do. No other form of life can begin with an image, a sense of what they choose to experience, and then modify and change and hone that image and say, oh, I don't want that, but I'd like a little bit more of this, until we get it just right. We are simulating in our consciousness, what it is that we choose to experience, and then it is our love for what we have simulated or our fear of what we are simulating that sets into motion the energy in the field that allows this event to happen. That's our intention. 
it's our love or our fear. And sometimes people have uh, conscious and subconscious fears of, of what it is that's happening. So it, it gives a whole new, new perspective for some people that need a little bit more of a reason to understand their relationship to the world. But our ancestors, again, our ancestors understood this. So really well. A perfect. Can I just give you another example? Do we have time? Can I give you a perfect example? Please do. I think a lot of our, uh, our viewers know there was a time in my life when Tibet was very accessible to me in a way that it is not currently. So I used to take groups into Tibet from uh, you know, the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. Some of you watching were probably with me on, on some of those journeys. We took 40 people at a time, 26-day trips, 12 monasteries, two nunneries, uh, into, um, from Nepal up into the uh, Tibetan plateau. So we had the opportunity to be in some really remote and isolated monasteries that had not been disturbed or destroyed the way some of the more accessible ones had. And one of the first things that, that I noticed was these beautiful mandalas that the Tibetans had in the chanting halls. And I, my Tibetan is terrible, so through the translator, I would ask them, what do these images mean? What, I mean, sure, they're beautiful. And we've all seen the Tibetan mandalas. Some of them are the geometric shapes, the Sri Yantra, for example, or something like that. And what they told me blew me away, Alec. Now, I'm, I want you to think about this. We're talking about sound and how, so, how powerful sound is. Sometimes the sound is, is verbalized as a word. Sometimes the sound is created as a sound through the vocal cords, but not recognized as a word. 1,500 years ago, if you wanted to preserve that sound, how would you do that? We have no recorders, no cell phones, or anything like that. But the science of cymatics gives us insight into what we're talking about here. In cymatics, C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S, I, I think most of our viewers are probably familiar with cymatics, but if you're not, uh, it is the, the science of, of pumping vibration into a substance. It could be a liquid or a powdered substance. Uh, and the vibration will create uh, a replicable pattern in that substance. Well, what the Tibetans began to tell us is that those mandalas are the patterns from the sound that they create. And if we can create the sound in our body that, that creates that pattern, now we are mimicking the teachings that they left 1,500 years ago. It was an, a very ancient, very ingenious way for them to preserve uh, in the teachings the, the, the powerful healing sounds. And when you go into the monasteries, there are sequences of sounds. You make this sound first, then this sound, then this sound, and the, the, uh, the mudras that go along with those. And they're all depicted on those temple walls. So what this tells us, is it the power of sound and the ability for us to create sounds that influence and change our bodies for many different reasons, whether it's for intention, as we talked about, or whether it's for healing. That knowledge has been with us for a very long time. Science is only now catching up with the mathematics and with the theory that validates and confirms what our ancestors have said to us for a very long time. So I used the, the Tibetan traditions is, is one tradition because the visual component here in the American desert Southwest, our indigenous ancestors, all the native traditions all along the front range and down into the Sangre de Cristos and over into the Four Corners area and out into Arizona, they have very powerful oral traditions where father to son and mother to daughter and generation to generation, they pass on they say, make exactly this sound, exactly this sound when you do this prayer or this chant. And in that way, the tradition is carried on without the written record as they do in Tibet. So we live in a world, uh, the field, we are the field. The field is vibration. And we are born, we're wired with the ability to create our own vibration to influence the vibration that we find ourselves within and, uh, and I think that's what sound healing is all about. That's what the summit is really all about. Thank you. And I think that's a, that may be the most important point, that empowerment of how we have 
the ability to create sounds. You know, people yeah. speak of sound as the creative force in the beginning it was the word, but yet we have the ability to create <laughs> the creative force for all the benefits that you just discussed a few moments ago. So. Yeah, well, you know, Alec, where this gets really interesting is uh, even sound means different things to different people. Sound is vibration. Okay, so what we're really talking about is vibration. It becomes sound when we can hear it. And some people have capabilities to hear things that other people do not. So a sound may be perceptible by someone and not by someone else. So ultimately, we're talking about vibration. A lot of that vibration is in the range that is audible, where we can hear it. <clears throat> and this, this helps me understand why Grace Slick was so powerful to me in my life, because she created the vibrations that spoke to me about what was happening in my world, but also that helped me to feel better about what was happening in my world. And, and she had just, uh, she still does. She's got an amazing, amazing voice. As, as, well as, as well as Led Zeppelin, as well as Hendrix, as well as 10 years after. I mean, these were the people that influenced. Cream, Eric Clapton, you know, when, when I was uh, in, in that time in my life, uh, it was more than just the music. The music was important, but it was the, the words that were being used had such a powerful influence to help me crystallize maybe the nebulous feelings that were happening in my body. I would hear those words and I'd say, yeah, that's exactly, he just said, ex or she said, exactly what it is that I'm feeling right now, but I didn't know what words to put to the feeling. So it's a very powerful catalyst. And I, I just have to say, that's a great thing about, you know, in the 60s, it was a really difficult time. And we had some really great music that came out of the 60s. We're having a difficult time now. And, um, and there's some good music out there, but because our communication is so diversified through the internet and so many different YouTube channels and, you know, Spotify and, uh, you know, Pandora and everything, we don't have the focus. Everyone doesn't have the same focus of, of music. So I can't say that there is a, a song right now maybe, or even a genre that really is identifying what's happening with us now because everyone has found their own in this diverse collage rather than being focused in a few radio stations and three television stations, which is what we were all exposed to uh, back in 1960s. Isn't that interesting? Do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, that has good and bad aspects. I mean, yeah. I think this time right now is a little bit of a birthing pain chaos, but you know, Spotify has an upside and a downside, but on one side, it's awesome. Like, there's so much, almost any album, any artist you want to listen to is a click away. You can experience their music and be connected that way. Whereas before, you'd have to, like, drive to the record store or whatnot. I remember those days well. But it's so great that there's that opportunity for direct creator to audience connection, you know? It, it is, and, and I'm totally on board with you, Alec, I, and I, I like that. I like being able to access uh, an artist from Northern Africa that just happened to put his or her creation, you know, onto a YouTube video or something like that. I like that, but I'm, I'm looking at the consequence uh, of having such diverse opportunities and sources for music, and in that diversity – what we find is individuals will find their own music that they really identify with, but we don't see, at least from my perspective, I have yet to see one particular song or a band that everyone is recognizing, that everyone is saying, this is the soundtrack for our generation right now. This is the soundtrack for the global pandemic, for what's happening in our lives, because we're not seeing just the one or two or three TV stations or a couple of, you know, hit radio stations. It is so diversified. So I'm not saying that it's good, bad, right or wrong. It's, it's, it's what's different between now and, uh, and when we were in, in turmoil back in the 1960s. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting to see it that way. It is. And like I said, that's where I was getting a minute ago. It's sort of a scattered growing pain phase now. I'd like to hope it'll continue to evolve in a positive connection way but well, Alec, I, I just I, I want to take this to moment you're a musician as well aren't you to yeah. my understanding 
Yeah. Do you have a, a particular genre? Are you more of a blues musician or more of a rock musician? That's been my roots, you know. Playing guitar, that that blues guitar player vocabulary, that wellspring is what I always keep coming back to. So that's the main thing. And that you know, the power, you know, the power, the power of that music is like it's very simple, but it's that you, as you were talking about that feeling and tension when that blues guy BB King plays one note, it's like bang, it's like the lightning bolt. So there's a simple frequency, but there's a whole multi-dimensional transmission of energy and expression through these vibrations uh, uh, and thank you for your music the, the 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 science behind the music is what fascinates me when when i was a kid i used to say you know where did the notes come from that create the chord that feels good in my body a g chord is a very healing uh and an open g on a guitar is very healing where did the notes come from that make that? And, and to understand where those notes came from, I had to understand the mathematics of music and the relationship of tonality and scales and frequency. And it is a deep, deep relationship that we have with this primal vibration that we find ourselves in the world today and being able to tune that vibration in very specific ways that are meaningful to us to make the notes that make that G chord, you know? And we don't think about that very often, but sound, sound makes the world go round. Sound is, and vibration, plays such a fundamental role. It is such a primal role because we begin responding to it before we even are consciously aware that we're responding to it. We begin responding as, as babies will respond to this, to, to very certain sounds and, and in specific ways and other sounds in other ways, because it's a language unto itself. Without words, the sound is, is a language. And when you combine the words that we make with those sounds, it's even more powerful and more potent. And that's why I'm happy to, to be able to contribute in whatever way I can to this Sound Healing Summit, bringing awareness to, to the power of sound in our lives, the power of sound in our world, and the power of sound in the presence of, of the chaos that we see ourselves immersed in today, sound has the potential to unify and bring us together in a way that very few other things have in the world today. So I just wanted to say that as uh, before we, we get much further in our, our conversation here. Thank you, because that's, that's the mission of sound these days. You know, it's, you can be useful for personal healing, physical healing and benefits, but using it to raise our consciousness up for the greater collective evolution. I think that's part of the calling of the sound healing and the sound work these days. Yeah. Thank you for those thoughts. So on that note, we are coming up to our last minutes here. So let's do this, I don't know, what's the music term, not the epilogue, there's the, uh, there's a musical term for the last part of a piece. I can't think of what it is right now. The, uh, denouement. The end. <laughs> <laughs> this is the end. Not the end. This is not the end. It's but an initiation, but no. a beginning. So, if people would like to explore these ideas of yours further and find out more about your latest book, where's the best place to go? Uh, well, the latest place, the best place to go, uh, my website, of course, www.gregbraden.com. It's G R E G G, two G's. My mom gave me two G's because two G's is just a plain Greg, whereas one G is short for Gregory. So I'm not a Gregory, I'm a plain old Greg with two Gs, and that's my website, uh, www.gregbraden, B-R-E-D-E-N.com. Um, you can see where I'm, well, you can see where I used to speak when we were doing live events, and now you can see where those live events have been converted to streaming and live and online events. You can see uh, all the, the books that are out there, and, you know, Alec, uh, I mean, as we're talking about this, the sound for me, it's important. And it's one aspect that comes back into this fundamental revolution that we are experiencing right now of, of humanness. What does it mean to be human? And what is the role of humanness in, in our lives? And we're being challenged to embrace our humanness, perhaps more so now than ever before, when it comes to our immune system. This is a beautiful example. We are being conditioned to believe that we are powerless, that we are frail, fragile beings in the presence of a contagion, 
that's in the world and that we need something external to us to make us feel safe so that we can live in the world, that we can love fully in the world. We're being conditioned to believe that we cannot have those experiences, that we cannot have community and gather together the way we have in the past unless we have something outside of our bodies to give us some kind of defense. Now, there are some people for a lot of reasons that may very well need that external support. And if you're one of those people, I'm happy it's there and I'm happy it's available and by all means use it. But what I want people to know is we modern humans, anatomically modern humans, we emerged mysteriously on this planet about 200,000 years ago. Scientists still, we have theories. We don't know exactly where we came from. We appeared relatively suddenly in the evolutionary record. But here's the key. We were already intact. We had everything then that we have now. We can take the DNA from the fossilized remains of ancient forms of our ancestors out of the bone marrow, and we can compare that DNA to us today. And what we see is we have not changed in 200,000 years. We emerged intact rather than slowly, gradually developing all of these processes over time. What that says to us, it says a lot. One of the things it says is that we are made for times like this. We are made to adapt, not just adapt, but thrive in the presence of contagions. We've done this successfully for 200,000 years. We have done this. Our body knows how to deal with these contagions. And this is what's really interesting. If you look at the external, the external ways of dealing with this, such as a vaccine, what a vaccine does is it mimics what we do in our bodies. The vaccines mimic what we already do in our bodies as much external technology does. There's an emerging philosophy that consciousness informs itself through its creations. Don't think about that. Consciousness informs itself through its creations. That means the books we write, the music we create, the sounds we make, the movies that we make in Hollywood, in addition to being entertaining and being diversions, they may actually be telling us something about ourselves, us, consciousness, asking ourselves through our creations to remind ourselves of deep truths within ourselves. And you look at the movies that are most popular and the ones young kids are drawn to, especially of superpowers within us. And, and they speak to us because there's some part of us that knows that we are capable of so much more than we've been led to believe. So there is a trans human movement that is conditioning a younger generation to believe that the human body uh, is essentially a fluke of biology, a mistake of nature that we need. We need to replace our soft technology with wires and chips and chemicals. And we are at this crossroad right now. And my, one of my latest books, Human by Design, talks about this, where we're only beginning to understand that we are the technology. Instead of wires and chips and chemicals, we are blood and neurons and cell membranes, much more sophisticated than any chip could ever be. And as we learned to self-regulate this powerful operating system, this, this soft technology, what we find is that we have less need for that external technology. So if we need that external technology, if you feel like you need it, it's out there, by all means use it. But for the most part, what we're finding is when we, and this is the key and this is what I wanna say here, it's all about love. When we love, not if, but when we love ourselves enough to give ourselves what we need to be at our best. So we love ourselves enough to give our bodies what they need to do what they are made to do. And you know what this is. It's, it's good nutrition. It's uh, adequate sleep. It's movement. Uh, it's the kinds of thought, feeling, and emotion that honor, that honor these deep relationships we have with ourselves. When we love ourselves enough to give ourselves what we need, what we find is that we thrive, not just survive, but we thrive in the presence of what life brings to our doorstep, including contagions that we've never seen before. So I think while this has been a conversation now, like on the back burner for a lot, uh, a lot of people for a long time, all of a sudden in February of 2020, it came to the front burner because our immune system is determining 
how we survive in the presence of the COVID-19. And it all comes back to us understanding our relationship to ourselves. Sound is a very powerful part of that. Words, language are a powerful part of that. And we talked about that earlier in this conversation. So as we become conscious and aware of the words and the sounds and the, the way that we nourish our bodies and the way we move our bodies, what we're doing is we're honoring these deep relationships. And in the presence of that honoring, we transcend, not just survive, but we transcend the great challenges that come to us. Uh, and that is the beauty of our humanness. And I think of all the things that are happening right now, front and center, we are now fully, perhaps for the first time, beginning to understand what it means to be human, how precious our humanness is, and how powerful our humanness is in the presence of the unknown. So I, I, I just wanted to say that because when people are looking at the books, the books, I talk about sound and vibration, and I talk about a lot more than that. And the conversation that we're having right now is reflected in, uh, in those books and tapes and, and videos, the power of, of what it means to be human, human by design. Oh, I love that as, as a one liner message for these times transcend, not merely survive and yeah. via those constructions, technologies of consciousness, not external reliance. And so, yeah, that's, that's it right there. Right there. Well, you know, but, I, like, I mean, we, we do, we talk about this. It's so interesting. I worked in the high tech industry as a scientist and as an engineer through late 70s, 80s, and into the early 90s before I became a full-time writer and researcher. I worked in the defense industry and the energy industry. I saw amazing technology and I have yet to this moment, I've yet to see any technology built outside of our bodies that does not mimic something that we already do in the cells of our bodies. Our cells, our cells transmit energy, they receive information. They transmit photons and light. They receive photons and light. We, we store information. Every cell in our body is 0 0.07 volts of electrical potential. We're gated, what's called gated electrical potential across the cell membranes. We have over 50 trillion cells in our body times 0 0.07 volts of potential. You do the math and we are very powerful beings, potentially. We regulate this power. We are transistors, resistors, capacitors. All that is happening in the cells of our body. And we self-regulate through thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, sound, vibration. That makes us very, very powerful beings. And we're rarely taught that. And our young people are rarely taught of how precious and fragile, yet powerful and resilient our bodies really are. And when we begin to embrace that, that's the new human story. That's, that's I think, where the action is. That's the juice in, uh, in the new world that's coming. It's the next great frontier embracing our humanness because we're at the crossroad where we have to make this choice. Are we going to, to embrace our humanness or are we going to give ourselves away to the chips and the wires and the chemicals and the external technology that replaces our cells and our bones and our neurons? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know we cannot make that choice until we understand fully what it means to be human. Sound, vibration, sound healing, is a huge part of that. So that's why I'm, I'm excited to be with you today and have this conversation today. Well, it's an honor to have you here. And we only have literally like two or three more minutes. But I just have to mention how that all relates to you know, the other major thread of your work, studying the ancient wisdom traditions. Because you look at the past, we see these things that are still in plain sight, these epic feats of engineering, huge blocks of stone that cannot, could not be duplicated with our modern machines today. So that's fascinating what technologies of consciousness the ancients knew about. It, it is. You know, there. when I was in school back in 1950s, 60s, I was taught that civilization uh, began between 5,000 and 5,500 years ago in one place called the Cradle of Civilization, the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. Now scientists believe that there were six simultaneous cradles, not just one. There were six cradles of civilization that emerged uh, simultaneously and that they exchanged information between one another. And that's why we see so many similarities with pyramids and the knowledge of the cosmos and astronomy and uh, very specific star systems and things like that. But, but this is where it gets interesting. 
because climate change <clears throat> is changing the topography of the earth. And as ice melts in certain places in the earth, it is revealing archeological remnants of advanced technological civilizations that predate that 5,000 years. Mm. So now the thinking is that civilization is probably cyclic and the 5,000 years is the most recent cycle. And the question is in the cycle before that, 10,000 years ago, what, what did people know that we've forgotten or what did they know that we're only beginning to understand? And that is the topic for a whole new conversation that we can have in another shift summit. So yeah, I want to thank shift network for, for putting us together. You guys do an awesome job. Uh, just bring such a diversity of information to, to so many different people uh, in languages that are meaningful to them. You know, we all learn differently and that's the beauty of what we're doing. So uh, you let me talk a lot today, Alex. Thank you so much, my brother. I appreciate you and uh, all that you're doing. Uh, yeah. My love to you and, and this, this summit. And, uh, and I look forward to our next. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, once again for making the time to be here. And as you noted, thank you to the Shift Network for making the platform, providing the platform that makes us this all possible. And most importantly, thank you to everyone out there listening. It's, this would not be the same without you. So thank you for being here and come on back. We'll see you on the next session.